Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss flatfish, so let's jump right in. Having a highly dorsoventrally flattened body has been independently evolved several times among fish, and this form has appeared both in ray finned and cartilaginous fish. One of the most famous examples of this is the stingrays, which are members of the cartilaginous fish clade chondrichthys, specifically the superorder Batoidea. We'll meet the other members of chondrichthys in the next video, but for now, let's just stick with the stingrays. Stingrays are broadly characterized by their flattened bodies and possessing very large pectoral fins that are often fused to the head. Pelvic fins are very small and situated at the back of the body, in front of the tail. Male claspers, which serve as the intromittent organ in chondrichthians, sit just under the base of the tail. Stingrays have their eyes and spiracles on top, while their gills and mouth are on the bottom. The reason for this is that most stingrays are benthic predators, consuming various crustaceans and mollusks. Stingrays take in oxygenated water through their spiracles, which sit behind the eyes, and then pass it out through their gills. Trying to breathe through the mouth when it's pressed against the sand would be a bit difficult. Not all stingrays live a benthic life. Manta rays and cow nose rays are pelagic predators instead. However, all batoids look very stingray-like, except for the order Rhinopristiformes, which looks a bit more shark-like. Rhinopristiformes includes the guitarfish and sawfish. This order also contains some lesser-known members like the banjo rays, family Trigonorhinidae, that look more like stingrays, and the wedgefish, family Rhinidae, that look a lot more like sharks. There's even a wedge fish called the shark ray, rhina and xylostoma. Confusingly, sharks have independently invented a sawfish-like form, the order Pristioforiformes, called the saw sharks. Both sawfish and saw sharks have a long pointed rostrum where the teeth stick out from the sides. Not to be outdone, there was another clade of now extinct sawfish-like chondrichthians called the saw skates, suborder Sclerorhynchoidei. Skates form the batoid family Rogidae, which is closely related to the saw skates. The body fossil record of both stingrays and sharks is rather poor because chondrichthians have unossified bones, except for their teeth. This is why there's such heated debate over what megalodon look like. Occasionally, body fossils are found, which is how researchers know that sharks convergently evolved a manta ray-like body shape at least once, as seen in the late Cretaceous Aquila Lamna. But because stingray body fossils are fairly rare, we don't know much about their early evolutionary history. The oldest unambiguous stem stingrays hail from the Jurassic, like Belemnobatus and Spathobatus. And while these genera are more primitive than any modern stingrays, they look pretty stingray-like overall. We don't currently have a nice, gradual sequence of fossils from more shark-like forms to more stingray-like ones. However, even though we don't have much in the way of stingray fossils, we can glean some information based on the wide body shape diversity of extant chondrichthians. We can look from the torpedo-shaped gray reef shark to the more flattened nurse shark to the angel shark, which has large pectoral fins and hunts like stingrays. As for ray finned fish, some angler fish, like the monkfish, which happens to be a delicacy, and loaches, like the butterfly loach, have evolved dorsoventrally flattened bodies. Even some placoderms, like the early Devonian Gemwindina and Paraplesiobatus, evolved to be flat. For the latter genus, I had to find the original 1933 paper on it, which is in German, and then use the magic of the internet to translate it to English. The paper says, quote, the ray-shaped body suggests a benthic way of life, close quote. Hence why the author included the Greek batis in the name, which refers to stingrays. 
However, what these fish share in common with the stingrays is that all of them are bilaterally symmetric in their adult form, meaning their left and right sides are nearly identical. The vast majority of animals are members of the clade Bilateria, being defined as having mostly mirrored left-right sides. We'll discuss exceptions to this, such as the radially symmetric echinoderms, when we reach the ragworm's tail. A striking exception to the trend of bilaterally symmetric flat-bodied vertebrates is the flatfish order Pleuronectiformes, which contains the well-known and tasty flounder, halibut, place, sole, and turbot. As adults, both eyes of a flatfish sit on one side of the head. Whether that's the left or right side depends on the species. For the vast majority of flatfish species, all individuals either have their eyes on the left or right side of the head. However, several species exhibit switching from one generation to the next. Oddly, when raised in captivity, members of some flounder species, like the Japanese flounder Paralichthes olivaceus, are more likely to be right-eyed compared to their left-eyed natural counterparts. Other species, like the starry flounder Platichthes stellatus, are more likely to be left-eyed as one moves west from California to Japan. Now, even though flatfish are asymmetric as adults, they're members of the clade Bilateria, and their juvenile form betrays this ancestry. Juvenile flatfish are bilaterally symmetric, just like any other fish. As they age, the flatfish skull and body starts remodeling. In essence, flatfish undergo metamorphosis, and interestingly, the trigger for metamorphosis is thyroid hormones, as we mentioned, trigger metamorphosis for many animals in the axolotl's tail. Finally, we have to ask, is there adaptive value in having an eye that is partway between the original vertebrate condition and the modern flatfish condition? Or would it have been maladaptive for a proto-flatfish to have the intermediate condition? This question caused Darwin to accept a Lamarckian method of evolution for a flatfish, whereby they attain their current form through the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Later, biologist Richard Goldsmith posited that the current flatfish condition must have resulted from a single massive mutational leap. Today, though, we know better. We have Eocene flatfish fossils displaying the intermediate condition. Heteronectes and Amphistium from 53 million years ago have an eye on one side of the head that is incompletely metamorphosed. While the eye is higher on one side of the head than that of other fish, it has not completely migrated to the other side of the head. And then there is the basally derived family Cetodidae, also known as the spiny turbots, whose eyes just barely pass the fish's midline, not in the more advanced position of most flatfish. In Cetodidae, whether the fish is right or left eyed is seemingly random, indicating that eye sidedness was ancestrally random before becoming stuck one way or the other. So, in a sense, the remodeling of a flounder's face is a mirror of its evolutionary history. And that's the flounder's tail. Having a flattened body has evolved in fish repeatedly, most likely as an adaptation to ambushing benthic prey, and flatfish, like the flounder, have taken this to an extreme, transforming their body from bilateral symmetry to asymmetry. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.